as a side note, it smells really amazing in here right now. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is by far the weirdest thing I've ever done on BookTube. This is BookTube by Candlelight. And I'm going to try to have BookTube by Candlelight without burning down my house or setting my hair on fire. But here's the thing, today we're talking about Edgar Allan Poe. And you can't talk about Edgar Allan Poe unless it's like in candlelight. You have to talk about Edgar Allan Poe in candlelight. That just, you have to. Very recently, uh, Second and Charles, which is affiliated with Books A Million, was kind enough to send me some free free books and included was this illustrated version of Edgar, that's no illustration there, of Edgar Allan Poe work. I do have a complete works of Edgar Allan Poe that I have had since I was in college. Now Edgar Allan Poe is a favorite of mine, however I have different kinds of favorite authors. For instance, I have authors who I want to read all the time. I have authors whose work I will reread several times. And Edgar Allan Poe is not one of those authors for me. <laughs> he is not an author that I reread very often. In fact, prior to being sent this book, it had been quite a while, a span of years, since I had read anything by Edgar Allan Poe, even a short poem. However, Edgar Allan Poe has earned his place on my top authors list simply because he writes the kind of stories and poems that stick with you. When you've read an Edgar Allan Poe short story, you've probably never forgotten about it. That is just a testament to the kind of writer that he is. He's a pioneer of our contemporary horror genre. I cannot pretend to be an Edgar Allan Poe scholar. I have not... I've not extensively researched Poe, I've not analyzed and broken down every single story by him. I'm in it just for the reading enjoyment. I'm in it just for reading pleasure. Still, the stories haunt me and stay with me. Edgar Allan Poe was a poet, he was a short story fiction writer, and he was a reviewer. I've never exposed myself to any of Edgar Allan Poe's story or book reviews, but I know that there are books out there that compile those reviews and you can read those. So I'm talking specifically today about Edgar Allan Poe's short stories. Poetry does not come easy to me. I don't read poetry easily. So while I have been exposed to Edgar Allan Poe poems, I can't speak very intelligently about them. Short of The Raven or Annabelle Lee, that's, that's about as, as far as I've gone, as far as I've delved, because it's, it's poetry is hard. Poetry is, I'm, mm -mm, no. So why do I love Edgar Allan Poe's short stories? Well, one, they stick with you. Yes, of course. But why do they stick with me? The answer is not because they're horrific or macabre. While they are shocking, most of them are shocking or have shocking ends, I think that they stick with me because they are brilliant illustrations of insanity. And there's certain types of horror that I like, which I've talked about throughout the month and I'll even be talking about in next Sunday's video. I like certain types of horror and they, they tend to be human in nature, human psychology. You know, I like books with psychopaths and sociopaths and people who are insane. And Edgar Allan Poe writes about insanity better than anybody that I've ever read. Was it because he himself was insane? Who knows? If not, he sure did channel that shit pretty accurately. And it's not just in the content. The insanity does not come through just from the subject matter, what these characters' actions are. And they are shocking, and they are insane, and they are those of very, very disturbed characters. 
But Poe's language is insane. <laughs> Poe writes repetitive phrases over and over and over again. He uses the same words a lot. That repetition enhances the pace of the story and the frantic gotta get it out, can't even think of a different word kind of thing. Additionally, Poe breaks a lot of rules in his writing. He is by no means going to stick to rules of grammar, rules involving sentence structure. There are so many exclamation points thrown into the middle of sentences in Poe's writing that I wouldn't even want to count them. It's, it's, it's very stream of consciousness in his writing. And what also makes that impressive is that a lot of his stories are written in the first person. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. So what you have as a reader is a narrator, a character talking directly to you, and they're speaking in a manner in which is repetitive and excited and frantic. And it just drives home the, the, the idea that this person is insane. And to me, there's not a lot of, of things scarier than insanity. I like predictability. I like to be able to rely on things. I'm a statistical person. I, I, I deal in likelihoods. I tell that to my fiance all the time. I deal in likelihoods because yes, I do. I am a dreamer. I do believe that anything is possible, but when I'm conducting my life and making my decisions, I tend to go with the things that are most likely. And when you're dealing with insanity or when you're confronted with someone who is insane, the rules go out the window. You're dealing with chaos. There is no predictability. There is no rationality. Anything goes, anything is possible. And when that's inside of a human being, it can be quite terrifying. And so Poe's narrators frighten me. They frighten me enough that 20 plus years after my original exposure to Edgar Allan Poe, I still really like and yet really dread reading the story. The other thing that I really love about Edgar Allan Poe's stories, specifically the ones written in first person, is that you always start out with a recollection or a, a recounting of events and you, you think you're speaking to a very run-of-the-mill average person. The, the dramatic rise, the build-up, the <laughs> I don't know what else to call it is awesome. There's so much buildup. You think you're down here talking to a very rational individual and the more that they talk, the more frantic they become and the more crazed the story gets until eventually at the apex or at the climax or at the height of the tension and suspense, you realize that you've come a really long way with a character in just a few pages because again these are short stories he's not writing epic fantasies or, or, or full-length novels and what he manages to accomplish especially illustrating something as complex as insanity or as complex as crime solving or as, I mean, and he manages to do it within a few pages. It just, I love it. Another thing about Poe's short stories or poems even, and, and the fact that they're written in first person and the fact that they are very much about the human psyche and, and all of that, the, they're really fun to perform really fun to perform. I am not, and I, I get stage fright and I can't, I, public speaking is so not my thing, but I remember having to do a scene or something in my, one of my, probably my public speaking class in high school, like having to perform something. And I performed The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. 
I also was a prop master on the high school production of some of Poe's short stories. So they're really exciting to perform and, and they're like monologues. The ones that are written in first person are very much like monologues. And Edgar Allan Poe's work is part of the public domain now, so I thought, while I don't still have this stuff memorized because, you know, I'm not that good, I thought that I would read for you The Telltale Heart in the way that I read Poe. So I'm going to do that now. If you're not interested in that, <laughs> then by all means, you can go ahead and skip it. Just leave your comments about Poe or your thoughts and opinions about Edgar Allan Poe down in the comment section for me below. And if you're not a fan of Edgar Allan Poe, let me know. Let me know what I can do to help convince you. So without further ado, those of you who want to stick around, here is the Telltale Heart. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been, and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How, then, am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult, and for his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it, it, it was his eye. Yes, it, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You, you fancy me mad, but madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, just oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. You would have laughed at how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern, cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it, it wasn't the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he has passed the night. So you see, 
he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was opening the door little by little and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea and perhaps he heard me for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I, I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo, the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He'd been saying to himself, it's nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the sense? Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I, I say, louder and louder every moment. 
Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder and louder. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I, I threw open the lantern and leapt into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled <laughs> gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with this muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I, I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you'll think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything was wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught it all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things, but Ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and, and, and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness. Until at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt, I now grew very pale but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. 
Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more, I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart.